Welcome to the Garden Talk Podcast, where we interview growers from all over the world, both beginners and experts, seeking to learn more about what they know about gardening and how they do things in their garden. What's up, everybody? For you that don't know me, my name is Chris, aka Mr. Grow It, and you're tuned into the Garden Talk Podcast. This episode number 111. In this episode, I interview Luna Whitcomb. She has been gardening for 15 years and has experience with indoor, outdoor, greenhouse, and field cultivation. She is a writer for Skunk Magazine, and her methodologies revolve around organic gardening. She has knowledge on microscopy, biology, entomology, agronomy, botany, and enzymology. In this episode, she talks about organic gardening methods that she does in order to help improve the taste and smell of the final product. If you want to see highlights of these podcast episodes, search Garden Talk Clips on YouTube. That is a channel dedicated to short clips of these podcast episodes. One of my goals of this podcast is to bring free information about gardening to the general public. That being said, I'd like to thank the sponsors of today's episode who helped make that goal possible. Thanks to AC Infinity for sponsoring this episode. My entire ventilation system is AC Infinity. I have their inline fan, ducting, carbon filter, and their controller. I love the Controller 69 Pro with temperature, humidity, and VPD programming and having control of different fan speeds. This makes it so much easier to control my grow environment. Their Controller 69 Pro version also controls their oscillating fans, grow lights, and humidifier. The discount code MrGrowIt15 works on both Amazon and their website, acinfinity.com. Stash Blend. I've been using Stash Blend for over a year now, and it's awesome. One of the things that I really like is that it saves me money. It's a whole bunch of different inputs in one. So I no longer have to go out there and buy a silica bottle, then a separate seaweed bottle, beneficial bacteria, then a separate one for mycorrhizal fungi. All of that plus more is in this one blend. Go to stashblend.com to learn more about it. And I also have a link down in the YouTube description section below. And we are back. Welcome to the Garden Talk Podcast. Today I am joined with Luna Whipcomb. How are you doing today? Pretty good. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, thanks for coming on. So I initially came across you through the FCP channel, and I, I think you've been on there multiple times. And I mean, if you just search your name into YouTube, there's several different talks, and you have a lot of knowledge when it comes to gardening, more on the advanced side of things, which really piqued my interest because we do have... Uh, quite a bit of advanced folks here that tune into this uh, podcast. And uh, I know you're all into the organic side of things. So that's really what I wanted to get into today is kind of organic gardening. And I know a lot of folks, their goal is really to bring out a good taste and smell in the final product. So kind of utilizing these methods and kind of how we go here, if you have any tips uh, along those lines, please feel free to mention them because that is uh, certainly an end goal for a lot of folks. But before we get into the questions, can you just give us a little bit of background about yourself? Kind of tell us how you got into gardening and stuff like that. Yeah, sure. Uh, so my name is Luna Wickham. I specialize in agronomy, soil biology, microscopy, enzymology. Um, I do a lot of work on building soil and making nutrients available in soil through balancing nutrients through the soil mineral balancing theory, as well as making them available with mimicking root exudates, adding amino acids, enzymes, carbohydrates, uh, and processes that promote biology, consume nutrients, cycle them through their different processes, and make them available to plants to promote health, vigor, flavor, uh, and aroma. I originally got into gardening um, through growing medicinal plants. I started cultivating in 2009. I've been cultivating for 15 years. Um, doing outdoor, living soil, outdoor organic cultivation, um, growing in ground, using a lot of teas, a lot of different inoculants, a lot of compost, um, and really forming an alliance with nature to promote you know, healthy, vigorous medicine, like to, to grow real medicine that's therapeutic, flavorful, enjoyable for people. Um, did this in Northern California, I've also done it in Southern Oregon. I have experience doing consulting on hemp farms and growing in greenhouses, indoor, outdoor, um, using synthetic nutrients, also using organic nutrients. I kind of just touched on all of that. Good stuff there. So I'm going to ask you a controversial question right off the bat. And uh, do it. I Let's like hear to it. Ask, <laughs> many growers claim that growing with organic inputs and utilizing microbiology results in the plants producing a better taste and smell. They swear by it. They say, hey, organic, way better than anything bottle-grown. 
What's your take on that? I subscribe to that ideology also. I've done hydroponic cultivation for many years. Um, I've also done living soil and organic cultivation. From my understanding of how it kind of results in better flavor and aroma is that each of these compounds that produce flavonoids, they produce aroma, they produce, you know, the different diversities of smell. They all require a complex chain of compounds prior to their formation to be able to be expressed, genetically expressed in a plant. So if you're lacking any piece in the chain that's required to biosynthesize these compounds, they simply just won't synthesize. So in a hydroponic growing environment, we have a very, we have a much more narrow profile of nutrients and compounds. We have our major ones, you know, that you hear of the NPK, the calcium, the magnesium. Um, but when it comes down to different forms of nitrogen, different forms of phosphorus, different forms of calcium, living soil has a much broader diversity of these compounds while also including a diversity of amino acids, a diversity of enzymes, a diversity of organic acids. And these compounds all have, uh, they create unique physiological responses in plants and they produce different genetic expressions. So when you have a larger diversity of these compounds, it allows the plant to biosynthesize different flavonoids and, and you know, volatile organic compounds, the things that produce aroma like esters, phenols, thiols, which produce a different profile, a more depth profile of aroma. And I believe that that's more achievable and more likely to be achievable in a living soil setting, in an organic setting, than in a hydroponic setting. However, that's going to be based on user, on like the user success. So just because you're growing in organic doesn't necessarily mean you're going to end up with a better product. Um, and a lot of the times it's more difficult for people to grow in organic settings because it can be a little bit more complicated. Um, and you may not result, uh, have an end result that is, you know, more flavorful, has more aroma, more aromatic. So I think that it's potentially possible that you can have more flavor, more smell. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you will. Understood. That's a really good way to break it down. And I think you've re revealed some information here that hasn't been revealed on any of the past episodes. Now, one of the things, a uh, follow-up question to this is, uh, and I know we're going to get into microbes here in a little bit, but uh, it, this relates to microbes, is what is their impact to mm -hmm. the taste and smell that the plants express? So microbes, during their processes of decomposing organic matter, they secrete enzymes that are key components and building blocks um, or key components to processes that provide the diversity of organic compounds needed by plants to produce different flavonoids and aromas. They also, they secrete, um, they secrete enzymes, they secrete carbohydrates, they break down organic matter, but they also convert particular organic acids into other organic acids. They can also break certain organic acids down um, so they're no longer viable, they're no longer useful by the plant, but they can also stabilize organic acids. And like I mentioned earlier, they, organic acids have specific plant physiologic stimulating effects. So microbes, with their interaction with the soil and the diversity of compounds in the soil, the nutrients, the um, organic acids, like I had said, and the different, the broad profile of these different things that exist inside of the soil, their their role changes the composition of these things and allows for a wider diversity. So on top of that also, microbes can be what's called endophytic. And what that means is they can exist inside the cell of the plant. And inside the cell of the plant, they also do these processes. But an important part of this, like a, an important piece of this puzzle is that they also can create phytohormones. So phytohormones, they trigger specific actions in the plant. They can tr trigger um, like pe pest defense, stress responses. They can promote different flowering stages. They can pr promote, you know, uh, node elongation, you know, bud swelling and stuff like that. They're made by the plant, but they use like the plant and the microbe work together to create these compounds. They can be created in the soil. They can also be created in the cell of the plant. So we have our 
decomposing microbes that do what I had mentioned, but we also have our endophytic microbes, which can exist inside the cell of the plant and produce these phytohormones directly at the cell to stimulate the plant to do these different processes and produce more aroma, more flavor, resulting in a better product. Incredible. Yeah. Endophytes is something that uh, I picked up, uh, learned from Jeff Lowenfels. So shout out to him. I had him on the podcast in the past. He did a really good breakdown of endophytes and their role. And he was so excited about it. It was incredible. I want to say a newer thing that's kind of been learned over the past, you know, five, 10 years or so. It seems like there's more focus talking about endophytes versus just the soil microbe and really uncovering more things that we're mm -hmm. learning about endophytes and how it impacts the plants. So really cool that you had mentioned that here. They're extremely fascinating. Yeah. And talking about the other microbes, uh, particularly the ones in the soil, you did a really good breakdown on another talk I had tuned in of yours talking about, you know, bacteria and fungi and archaea. Can you give us kind of like layman's terms or just kind of the basics of those microbes, kind of information growers should know to help improve plant health and growth? Sure. So um, what it sounds like you're referring to is like the soil food web. And we have like our lower bacteria, right? Which is, you know, kind of just what you think of when you think of bacteria. We also have like our protozoa, which are, which are kind of just like the, the predators within the, the soil world. Um, protozoa actually means early animal or first animal. They're supposedly the first step in evolution between bacteria and animal. And what they do is they run around, they swim around, they little wiggle around and stuff, um, and they consume the lower bacteria. So the lower bacteria consumes organic matter um, that possesses forms of nutrients, and then the protozoa will come around and consume that bacteria and unlock those nutrients. They change it from one form to another. Like I had mentioned earlier, just kind of touched on it, there are different forms of these nutrients. There's different forms of nitrogen. There's different forms of phosphorus. And what this biology is doing when it's consuming lower bacteria is it's changing it from one cycle to another. And you hear this as the nitrogen cycle or the phosphorus cycle. Um, there's also nematodes. Nematodes are like tiny little, little worms. They serve a whole bunch of different functions. There's predatory nematodes. Um, there's a lot of different species of nematodes. But a lot of the time they consume bacteria. They can also consume fungus. And in this process, they're breaking down and releasing nutrients from bacteria, but also converting things like polysaccharides into um, simple sugars. So they're taking complex sugars or turning them into simple sugars, um, and they're allowing for other biology to consume it and feed on. It's all just like this big cycle, right? And then we also have, you know, um, um, amoebas and archaea and stuff like that. And they all kind of serve similar functions as protozoa. There's flagellates, and the, they're within the protozoa family. Um, but further on, like in the soil food web, we have like microarthropods, right? Which are tiny, tiny insects, like mites. And mites can actually consume forms of protozoa. They also break down and shred organic matter. And their excrement um, is full of nutrients for the plant as well. So all of these components are required to really have like a healthy, living, organic soil that's full of cycling nutrients and a diversity of compounds that promote that flavor and that give, give people the, the outcome that they're looking for with living soil and organic cultivation. We can tailor different fermentations, whether they're aerobic with oxygen, um, multiplied with oxygen, or anaerobic multiplied without oxygen. We can tailor different fermentations to introduce specific forms of these biology. We can also tailor them by adding different food sources to our fermentations. Different, different species of bacteria, they, they prefer different food sources, which is why there's different types of like agar plates and stuff like that, right? Um, so we can actually tailor our fermentations through different food sources, through different polysaccharides, as well as different enzymes and amino acids to promote diversity within like our fermentations and introduce them to the soil. That's kind of more complicated and requires a little bit of understanding, but it's a really, really fascinating aspect of living soil that I think people shouldn't ignore. And it's also really a lot of fun. So you hear about people talking about um, lactic acid bacteria serum or fermenting, th you know, making activated um, effective microorganisms or um, aerated compost teas and things like that. That's, that's kind of the, the, 
the foundation of it, but you can take it a little bit further when you understand how biology works and what it requires to multiply, then you can, you can promote the multiplication of very specific species of biology, especially if you're using inoculants like a source inoculant. For example, there's um, you know, phosphorus solubilizing microbes, right? You can introduce phosphorus solubilizing microbes, the food source they prefer, as well as the enzymes that they secrete to kind of give them the home and the stimulation they require um, to thrive and multiply them. And I think that that's like, that's kind of like the next level, like advanced stuff that people can get into. Um, that really takes someone from struggling with living soil and organic cultivation to like really taking full advantage of it and seeing like its real potential, which can be intimidating. But in the end, the juice is definitely worth a squeeze. And I highly encourage people to dive down those rabbit holes and learn about microbes and biology to, you know, level up their game. That's interesting. Yeah, I think a lot of people use microbial inoculants. Um, you know, they're buying it off the shelf, whether it be like a mammoth pea or a tribus, or there's a ton of different microbial inoculant products on the market today. And, uh, you know, they're using those, they're adding them in. And then, of course, it's they're doing their jobs in the soil there. Do you use any microbial inoculants? Or are you kind of doing like the IMO natural farming process? IMO, for those that don't know, it's indigenous microorganisms. There's basically a process that's done where you can get microbes naturally from your native soil, for example. Can you talk to us about kind of microbial inoculants, like ones that you use, or maybe the IMO process if you do that? Sure. Um, so I actually don't use the IMO process. I have um, particular opinions about it, um, and we can get into that too. But to first answer your original question, I will use some microbial inoculants, specifically if I'm after a particular endophyte, right? So a lot of these bottle inoculants, they have, you know, bacillus species that are pretty common um, and exist kind of ubiquitously in nature. Um, and you can really harness them just with high quality earthworm castings and insect frass. So I like to just source that. My inoculant source is earthworm castings and insect frass, which is my preferred method of inoculant because insects, they do what's called mesophilic composting where they take organic matter and they break it down mesophilically, which is like uh, medium temperature, which so they have we have mesophilic, we have thermophilic. Thermophilic would be like traditional composting where you're turning and it's getting really hot. Um, that heat can limit diversity of microbes. It also produces CO2, not in any excessive amount that it's you know really damaging to the environment, but potentially it can be. And I prefer to not put the labor in to turn compost piles, but to use insects kind of as my allies to break down organic matter faster, in my opinion, with less labor and produce a wider diversity of biology that I can introduce as my microbial inoculant. So if I am after very specific species of, of biology of microbes, like, um, you know, the phosphorus solubilizing bacteria that I had mentioned earlier, I'll pick up a product like mammoth pea. I'll also you know, find all source enzymes that are secreted, secreted by those specific bacteria. You can buy them online. There's different websites. Um, introduce them to like a fermentation. Find the specific food source that they prefer. Introduce that as, as well and let them multiply so that I'm not limited to the very small amount that I've purchased. And I like to do that with a bunch of different biology. Um, it sounds kind of intimidating. It's really not. But, um, when I do use bottled inoculants, I'll find specific bottled inoculants that have specific endophytes. So another one is uh, Rhodopseudomonas, Rhodopseudomonas palestris, which is a photosynthetic endophyte that you can find in a product like uh, Photosynthetic Plus, or I'm sorry, Photosynthesis Plus, which is a Microbe Life product. So those are the two that I really use. Um, I'll use Microbe Life um, Photosynthesis Plus, and I'll also use Mammoth P because those have very particular bacteria that I want. Um, another one would be like nitrogen um, solubilizing and fixing bacteria. So those are like the big ones that I'll use. So those are the big inoculants that I'll go after. But other than that, I use earthworm castings and insect frass as my go-to for my inoculants for my soil. 
Earthworm castings in tech for us. I love those two inputs. Really, really good. I use them in, in just about every grow as well. Let's get into inputs. Actually, let's first get into initial soil mix, right? So what is your kind of recommended soil mix to begin? A lot of people are going after the the one-to-one-to-one. Clagamus Coot is kind of made that famous, although he got that from a university. I forget which university he got it from, but it's a one part where it's either peat or cocoa, one part aeration, and then uh, one part of compost or worm casting. And then some people add fertilizer on it as well. But what's your recommended soil mix? So I love Coot. Um, I've actually done podcasts with him before. Um, I don't follow that heavy of an organic matter mix. I'll max out my organic matter at about 20%, but I've seen great results with organic matter as low as 5%. Um, 20% from a study that I've seen recently released by uh, Cornell University is kind of the maximum that, that Cornell has recommended in recent years. And I know that, that Koot is you know, a very knowledgeable person, um, but I think that that study was from a while ago. He released that Koot mix um, quite some time ago now, and it's a very... It's like probably the most well-known living soil organic mix out there is the the coot mix because he was one of the first people to just release it. I've used it before. It's not my favorite. In terms of like what's my favorite mix, if I told you, you wouldn't know the name of it. (laughs) So like no one would know what it is. But um, what I do is I follow a system called the Albrecht Soil Mineral Balancing Theory. And I encourage everyone to look this up. And it has different ratios of nutrients um, that are applicable to different soil compositions. And one of them being um, like rich potting soil that's mixed, you know, with peat or cocoa. Um, And it has different different ratios for NPK, so on through your your trace minerals, your micros. Um, And that's what I like to follow um, is the soil mineral balancing theory. There are some bagged soils that I will use. There's Sensi side that I like to use in Southern Oregon. Um, I had, uh, I grew the, these monster plants um, in Southern Oregon a, a few years ago, and I used that soil. It was great. It was a cocoa core based mix that was also balanced with Albrecht soil mineral balancing theory. Um, you know, he was an agronomist that came up with this, this approach to regenerating and remediating soil after the dust bowl. Um, he saw that there was a problem that needed to be fixed and he came up with these techniques and released it to the world but it was all kind of ignored um because there was a whole bunch of ammonium nitrate that had just hit the uh the industry um after the world war and people you know or there was a gentleman i forget his name but he realized that you can use ammonium nitrate to grow crops with and it totally changed the world and it produced tons of food for people um so his theory, um, uh, Dr. Albrecht, his theories kind of got brushed to the side because, you know, we can use this byproduct from the military industrial complex to grow all this food. But now it's kind of becoming more applicable with medicinal plant cultivation, where people are really trying to level up the, the nutrient cycling, the nutrient availability um, in custom soil mixes. And so now it's becoming more applicable. Um, but you look at all of his work and it's back you know, in the twenties and the thirties. Um, but it's really interesting and I definitely recommend people look into it. Um, any living soil mix is going to be pretty good. They typically tend to be pretty expensive and I recommend people learn how to mix it and do it themselves. Cause not only are you going to have a soil composition and a soil blend that's unique to you, it'll produce a unique expression within a plant. Um, resulting in an end product that cannot be mimicked without your very specific soil mix. So you can dive down this rabbit hole, kind of learn a little bit about agronomy and create your own soil mix that will result in your own unique product. But what it also does when, when you learn this is you now have the skill to take any soil outside and turn it into a lush, fertile garden. You can take native soil from anywhere with these practices and principles that you can implement and turn dead dirt into living soil and have a farm anywhere, which I think is one of the most invaluable skills that anyone can have. So I try to encourage people to, to learn how to use these techniques so that you can then 
it's you can then just possess what I think is one of the most valuable skills and powers out there. Like there's no bigger power than being able to feed yourself off of the land because of knowledge that you've possessed and learned, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, having the end goal of being able to use the native soil out of your backyard and use that, then you wouldn't have to go to the store to buy bagged soil, you know, spending money at the, the hydroponic store or your local nursery. Um, you wouldn't have to do that if you're able to take the, the soil from your backyard, repurpose it. You know, maybe uh, a lot of these are, are soils are too compact, depending on where you live, right? But uh, I know a lot of people uh, run into the issue where it's just too compact, not enough aeration, so they have to add aeration. Uh, I know some people, well, I, first of all, generally advise to grab a soil test, right? You want to get a soil test, find out what's in your soil to begin, and then kind of make adjustments from there. I know Tad Hussey, Kiss Organics, shout out to him. He had found uh, a considerable amount of heavy metals in, in some of his native soil. I forget where exactly it was, on if it was his current land or, or past land, but he had mentioned that he's not really able to use it. So like for those folks that are interested in using their native soil, you probably get a soil test to find out what's in there to begin uh, and then kind of make adjustments from there. A hundred percent. So so that's kind of one of the principles that are that are recommended in this, this soil balancing theory is like, you know, step one, you get a soil test, you see what's in it, you see what it's lacking, you see what it's abundant in, and then you make calculations and alterations from there. And if you do have an abundance of heavy metals, over time, you can remediate it with like cover crops and biology, but you may not be able to immediately use um, that soil right away. Um, if you're worried about heavy metals or testing requirements, um, there are also options of introducing certain inputs that will kind of suck in those those heavy metals things like biochar there's also an amendment um, called zeolite um, which has a very unique structure uh, like molecular structure that holds on to heavy metals also so there are ways to like remediate heavy metals but you're 100 percent right you a lot of times cannot just take a native soil um, and start using it to to grow in um, you 100 percent have to get testing done and then make calculations and alterations from there Good to know. I'm going to have to look into that uh, soil balancing theory in more detail and kind of get familiar with it. Because, uh, yeah, that's right now I am using just bag soil. I started off with Fox Farm Ocean Forest soil, and I turned that in. And I've been using that soil mm -hmm. for six, seven grows now. So, you know, adding organic nice. inputs uh, and being able to reuse that soil over and over and over again so I don't have to go to the store to buy bagged soil anymore. I live in Las Vegas, and uh, it's desert out here. So, like, I'm really nervous to try to use the the native soil in my backyard. It's mostly just sand and rock. Right. And, but hey, I, I've heard it's possible. So maybe I just need to roll up my sleeves and, and figure it out. Yeah, there's people who even dry farm in sand and have success with it. There's there's all these different regenerative and cultivation techniques um, that are really unique that have come up with solutions to a lot of different problems. You just kind of got to look around for them or ask someone who, who might know the answers. Yeah, absolutely. Now, for a lot of folks uh, that are tuning in, they're, they're probably not going to use their native soil. They probably are going to go out and buy a bag soil, and then they're going to attempt to use that as a good starting point and then continue to put in organic inputs and then, of course, reuse that soil over and over again. If somebody's going that route or even doing like a coots mix where they're creating their own soil mix, organic fertilizers or organic inputs – what do you recommend and how often to apply them? I know it's a very broad question, but throwing that at you, see if you can answer that. It is a broad question. So I use amendments, right? I use soil amendments to balance my soil. And then I focus on making those amendments available to the plant and usable by the plant through adding amino acids, enzymes, carbohydrates, polysaccharides, um, biology, and filling in the gaps of the soil food web. So fertilizers, fertilizer is kind of a funny word. Um, so in terms of fertilizers, I guess the, the fertilizers that I use would be um, sources of soy amino acids as my um, cation form of nitrogen, the NH4 positive, right? Um, Amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. They're also needed to, for the formation of enzymes. Um, I focus a lot on amino acids in my grow. Um, also, the cation form of, of nitrogen found in amino acids doesn't leach 
right? You hear about like nitrate runoff and stuff and how to affect the environment. Um, this doesn't. It it holds on to the negative charge um, cation exchange sites in the soil better, so that doesn't rinse out. Opposed to um, uh, the NO three negative anion that a lot of nitrogen sources are. So, in terms of fertilizer, I use a lot of soy based amino acids. I also use a lot of micronized inputs. So I'll use things like micronized langbanite which is um sulfur potassium magnesium right it's a mineral that is rich in sulfur potassium and magnesium um and if i need those nutrient sources those elements in my my soil um or my plants require them i'll add them in micronized form into a solution um with like some fulvic acid or some humic acid to kind of create my own carbon based fertilizers i'll also use things like micronized rock phosphate um which is calcium phosphate. So it has a lot of calcium. It has a lot of phosphate in it. Um, and phosphate is a key part of energy production inside of a plant. Um, same thing with nitrogen. So there's, um, I think it's <laughs> ATP, ad adenine triphosphate, I think is, is how you pronounce it, right? And it's um, formed with nitrogen and phosphorus, right? And when you introduce both of them, you're you're kind of creating an energy source for the plant. So I do things, I focus a lot on amino acids, micronized inputs, calcium, phosphate, potassium um, in micronized forms after I've custom built my soil to have a balance of these different nutrients with things like gypsum, um, fishbone meal, uh, green sand, crab meal, shrimp meal kelp meal, um, langbanite, like I had mentioned, what else is in my soil mix? Earthworm castings. Um, earthworm castings are also a source of nutrients. Um, however, I, I don't know. I don't, I would don't know if I would consider them fertilizer. Um, yeah. And then there's also other inputs that I'll add that aren't technically fertilizers, things that just kind of like promote cation exchange capacity, like, uh, clays, like bentonite clay, zeolite, that's a lot of it for in terms of like fertilizer is just I use organic dry amendments that I mix into soil with um, a biology source like earthworm castings, insect frass, and then my inert, you know, um, organic matter, things like peat moss, cocoa core, whatever. So that's mostly what I do. I don't actually buy much of anything that is like a nutrient source except for those micronized inputs but i like to use a lot of fulvic acids and enzymes and amino acids also to kind of like promote the availability and mimic root exudates which is like the function of how plants make plants i mean make nutrients readily available got it yeah i use uh, a handful of those inputs that you mentioned as well so you mentioned amino acids, and one thing uh, I'm looking at online right now, actually, I pulled it up, is raw amino acids. And uh, these things are quite expensive. I mean, uh, you get two ounces for $16.20, that's $8 an ounce, or you get like two pounds for $135. So you talked about amino acids and how you focus on that. Is a product like this, raw amino acids, is this something that you would potentially incorporate in your garden? Is it useful? So I think that's a dietary supplement. Um, so no, I wouldn't use that. I like to use bioags. So they have a few different products that have amino acids. They have calmino, they have multimino, um, they have nitromino. Nitromino is the most potent one. I think it's 14 or 15% nitrogen. Um, and that is not that expensive. I think it's a pound for like $18 or something like that, $15. Um, and it goes a long way. And no, so I think what you found was like a dietary supplement for people because all all cells require amino acids and they're helpful for humans to consume and for the soil to utilize and biology to utilize. Biology, plant cells, human, you know, animal cells, you know, we all use amino acids. So no, I don't, I wouldn't use that one. Okay, no, this one actually is from NPK Industries uh, and it does talk about- Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. It does talk about the chelates, ion nutrients, and facilitating plant uptake, movement into cells. Yeah, this particular one does seem to be. That sounds very expensive. <laughs> yeah, it does. That's what I was saying. That's what I was asking. Is it even worth it to buy it that way, or can we get amino acids from somewhere else? You know, we can get amino acids from from other places. Um, you know, um, since cells are all made of proteins, you can break proteins back down into amino acids using enzymes that 
break proteins down into amino acids. These are called proteolytic enzymes or protease. And it's a form of enzyme that will take a protein and break it back down into its original amino acid form. You can find this inside of um, uh, things like lactic acid bacteria serum, which I'm not sure if everyone's familiar with, but it's a fermentation of milk with lactic acid bacteria, lactobacillus species, um, that then contains proteolytic enzymes that you can add to plant matter that will break it down and turn it into amino acids. There's also specific plant inputs that are rich in amino acids, things like aloe vera, which I'm a big fan of using in, in my soil. And I'll just take aloe vera, whether cultivated by myself or from like a grocery store, clean it nice and good so you don't have kind of like funky weird stuff on it, chop it up into little pieces, throw it in a blender, strain it and water it into your plants. And there's a lot of really simple techniques like that that you can do to introduce, you know, um, amino acids as well as different compounds and phytohormones to your garden. Um, another one that I really like is um, red beet. Um, it is rich in a polysaccharide called inulin, which is great at multiplying um, bacteria. It also has nitric oxide in it, which promotes um, you know, metabolic processes inside of the plant. The list goes on and on. And if you have something growing in your native environment, you can actually look up the phytochemical composition of that plant on websites like Dr. Duke's Phytochemical Database. Um, and it'll tell you the full phytochemical composition, and you can take that information and look it up and see what each organic acid's physiological effects are on a plant and integrate it into your garden. And you can identify what the parts per million of phosphorus it contains, potassium, nitrogen, and so on, so that you can take your local native plants and through fermentation or through just blending and straining or composting or feeding to insects, you can integrate it into your garden organically, sustainably, regeneratively. Um, there's just so many cool things like that that would be really difficult to cover all of them in this, in this talk. But you can absolutely go out and find stuff and integrate it into your garden from your local environment. And I think that's where like the creativity and the, the art really comes into living soil cultivation. I think one thing that people worry about going that route is bringing in pathogens, right? You 100%. Know, I mean, we're kind of going back to the IMO process that we talked about and bringing in good microbes, but they also could be bringing in some bad microbes. And I know with fermentation, if it's not done right, there could be bad microbes in there as well. So I think that's one thing that kind of that's true. cautions people away from it. So, But yeah, you can definitely do it safely from what I've learned and kind of what you're mentioning here. So I guess it's just mm -hmm. a matter of uh, following it step by step and doing your due diligence and uh, looking under a microscope and seeing if those bad microbes exist in there or not, or if there are just good microbes in there and then utilizing that. And that's really difficult to do. Hmm. Um, you know, you can make a slide and look at it under a microscope, but being able to identify which species um, and which fungi based on their like morphological properties is extremely difficult um, and you could be sitting there looking at stock images all day long, trying to find the one thing and then think that you found it and you haven't. Um, it's, it's difficult. It's difficult to do. Um, and oftentimes you see people posting microscopy images, making claims that they've found this particular thing and they're completely off base. Um, it's, it's definitely, there's a reason why, you know, people are, <laughs> you know, go to college and study for, for years and years and years behind this particular uh, this study, you know, it's, it's definitely really difficult. Um, but you're 100% right. Like, you can bring in pathogens from the outside, um, which is one of the reasons why I'm really big into um, insect um, breakdown of things, because their gut microbiome is really effective at breaking down pathogens. Um, and then it's a much safer way to introduce it, which is why I really like earthworm castings and insect frass. Um, and things like, you know, doing turning of compost piles and stuff. I have seen so many people incorrectly compost and incorrectly make IMO and introduce pathogens to their garden. Um, it is, it's hard. It's hard to do it. Um, and it takes finesse. It takes a lot of attention to detail and thoroughness to really accomplish fully and like effectively. Um, I just outsource that labor to the bugs, you know, <laughs> that's, that's my approach. Um, 
but yeah, you're a hundred percent right. And you can absolutely go out and take something from somewhere and bring it in. Um, especially if your native environment isn't entirely healthy and your native, you know, ecosystem isn't fully intact. That makes total sense. Now we took a short break and you mentioned uh, something that you wanted to talk about. Root exudates. Root exudates. Yeah, let's get into that. Have you, yeah. Are you familiar with root exudates at all? Yeah, a little bit. Okay. Um, so root exudates are compounds that are secreted by roots to facilitate several functions. Um, one that I've touched on before um, is that they they feed specific profiles of biology to accomplish specific goals. For example, they will secrete profiles of amino acids, enzymes, and carbohydrates that promote the um, multiplication of phosphorus cycling um, bacteria. This is called the rhizophagy cycle. And during particular stages in the plant's development, it has different profiles of root exudates and of these compounds I just mentioned to feed specific species of bacteria to make certain nutrients available during certain stages in the correct proportions that the plant wants them, right? This is like the, the, the overwhelming majority of how nutrients are cycled um, and delivered to a plant in a living soil system is through root egg states. And each plant is, each species of plant is more or less effective at certain at feeding certain profiles or um yeah profiles of these compounds to feed specific species of bacteria so you'll see people introduce cover crops and companion plants living mulches that have a diversity of different plant species that are more or less effective at secreting root exudates tailored to specific nutrients to make them available so you'll see people use clover um, for nitrogen um, it fixes nitrogen from the atmosphere, but it also solubilizes nitrogen in the rhizosphere. And then you have things like buckwheat, which is really effective at um, phosphorus solubilization. Um, it secretes phosphatase, or it could be phosphatase. Anyway, and um, it's an enzyme that helps with nutrient cycling of phosphorus. This is crucial. This is like super key in bioremediation of soil as well as making nutrients available to your plants and keep in mind that these profiles of biology, you know, while they are also, you know, I'm sorry, these profiles of compounds, while they're feeding biology, they're also catalyzing chemical reactions and covalent bonds in the soil to make nutrients, you know, transform from one form to another. Right. So while living soil is like an ecosystem of bacteria and biology, um, it's also a perpetual chemical reaction. And so not only are we kind of working with nature, um, well, chemistry is still nature, but we are working with chemistry. We're working with bacteria biology, kind of forming an alliance with these, these living organisms, but we're also needing to understand how those aspects influence chemical reactions in the soil. And this is done a lot of the time through root exudates. Um, and we can introduce and kind of mimic root exudates with the different compounds that we play with. And that's like the, the key, the, like, the secret key behind effectively growing living soil is, is mimicking root exudates. Because this is how most nutrients change forms and become readily available. Um, there's also the, the soil food web and how I mentioned earlier, bacteria being consumed by protozoa. But the vast majority of how nutrients are uptaken is through the rhizophagy cycle and how root exudates interact with chemicals and with biology and those biology and that biology breaking down specific nutrients. It's crazy the amount of reactions that are happening down in that area, right? I mean, it blew my mind is back when I learned that... Uh, you know, acids are released by the plant in order to, and you touched on this, is kind of adjust the pH uh, to make nutrients more available, right? Iron is is a, a good example of that, where if the pH is too high, it's gonna iron's gonna be in a form that the plant can't uptake. So they release acids, gets in the correct pH range, then the iron is able to be converted into that form and, and uptaken by the plant. So it's so fascinating, uh, and I feel like there's still so much that we don't know <laughs> that we're still learning about it, and um, Man, it goes above a lot of people's heads. It goes above my head, to be honest with you, because there's there's just so much to it. It goes over everyone's head. There's a tremendous <laughs> amount about soil that we don't know. Um, 
that nobody knows that we're just still figuring out. And yeah, like you had said, there's such a complex network of reactions happening that how they all function and how they all interconnect with each other is, would be, would be so difficult to study because it's all in this microcosm world that is really difficult to observe. Um, and it's all mixed together in this like melting pot of, of things that separating them and, and studying them is really, really difficult for humans to do. Um, and oftentimes we just kind of have to like, let nature do it, you know, <laughs> let nature take care of it let the biology take care of it. Yep. And you know, that's one thing that makes it so fun is like, we're still identifying things and we're always going to be learning. I think all of us that are living here on earth right now, uh, we're going to be learning till the day we die. Right. And still not everything's going to be uncovered in regards to growing these plants and, and, uh, soil biology and so on and so forth. I read, think I read a stat somewhere where it's um, 99.9% of microbes haven't even been studied yet. <laughs> so it's like, we've got way like, yeah, where it's, it's insane. Also is that they're constantly quote unquote evolving, right? They're, they're not necessarily evolving as, as much as like their genetic composition is constantly changing. Are you familiar with um, horizontal gene transfer? No. Okay. So this is cool. Um, horizontal gene transfer is when there is a microbial density of bacteria to where they're so tight together inside of like a biofilm or just like a, you know, sludge, whatever, inside a solution, inside of water, where there's so much compaction, there's so much microbial density that they start tossing genes back and forth. They start tossing DNA back and forth. And those random combinations of DNA being passed back and forth can actually create new species of bacteria like spontaneously. And this is how like the first evolutions and combinations of bacteria formed um, were through this horizontal gene transfer back in like the primordial soup of like early amino acids and humates and enzymes. Um, you know, it it's perpetually happening. So you can experience biology changing potentially rapidly. But it pretty much means that we will never, ever, ever document all the different species of bacteria um, in the world because it's it's constantly changing. So we could we could find new bacteria that do new things every day for the rest of our life, you know, and never and never find them all. It's like this. It's like trying to find the edge of the universe. You know, you just can't you just can't do it. You're not going to be able to do it. Right. Yeah. It actually reminds me of viruses. Viroid, those can change up too. Right. I mean, we won't get mm -hmm. too deep into to that. We won't get off the subject here, but like it reminds me exactly of that, how they're always changing, evolving. Um, yeah. Let's bring it back into kind of more of, I guess, uh, let's loop in the beginners and intermediate folks a little bit more and give them some actions. Okay. What advice or, or tips do you have for folks that are maybe just getting started growing organically and they're really focusing on, they want a better taste to come out of there. They want a better smell to be produced from these plants. What's some uh, advice you have for them? I'd say like the, the first kind of easy step is make sure you have enough aeration in your soil. Make sure that you maintain it wet. You need to keep living soil moist. There are some habits that people learn from growing um, hydroponically that don't translate to living soil cultivation. One of them is letting your soil dry out too much. Um, and there probably will be people that disagree with me and want to talk about root respiration, um, drybacks and stuff like that. And I'd be happy to get into that conversation with people, but you need to keep living soil wet. One is because bacteria needs to be moist. It needs to have um, a, a solution, a space to exist, a media, which is water to exist in and to multiply in. All of living soil processes are so much dependent on bacteria and biology that when they start getting dry, they stop functioning properly. The rhizophagy cycle is very dependent on moisture. Keep your soil wet. Keep your soil aerated. That is the, the I see it so much. I see it so much. So I have a Patreon where I help people um, and they post images and stuff like that. Um, I see people just drying out their soil too much all the time. Just make sure you have enough biology, um, make sure you keep it wet, and make sure that you have good drainage. If you can do that, you could just water only. If you had enough soil, <laughs> you could water only um, and grow a plant completely to finish in living soil. Um, 
if you're having a small soil mass, it's going to be very difficult and you will have to add, have to add nutrients. Um, and it's going to be very difficult to keep nutrients balanced in a small pot. Living soil really wants large soil masses, moisture, and drainage and biology. That's like the stepping stone for growing living soil. And some people really struggle with that. Um, but but that's that's it. That's like the beginner step that I recommend to people. And then you can get into like fermenting and, you know, adding different profiles and stuff like that. After you learn about it, you know, um, people, it's a lot of fun to do these things. People like to get ahead of themselves, but you can make mistakes. You can introduce pathogens. You can add too much of an enzyme and cook your roots or kill your worms, um, kill your microarthropods. It, it can be complicated. Um, so just start with a lot of soil, keep it moist, keep it draining, add simple inoculants like earthworm castings and insect frass. If you want to use Bukashi, that's great. Use cover crops, companion plants to provide like that diversity of root exudates like we had discussed earlier. And you can just water it. You can just, you can just water it. <laughs> um, I did a full run in a tent with a, in like a four by four bed in a, in a tent. And it was just water, companion plants, soil with, you know, nine plants in it. And it just, that was it. And it was great. It worked out great. I didn't have to do anything to it. Super simple. Don't overcomplicate it. Yeah, it definitely can be super simple. Now, that's one thing that, uh, you know, you talk about keeping things moist. That's one thing I wasn't told when I first started growing organic. So I was taking my practice grow, using synthetics to where I was letting the medium dry out between waterings. And then the plant was showing deficiencies. And I'm like, hmm, is organic really the easier way to go about it? I was just doing it wrong. <laughs> I didn't have the medium moist enough. I didn't keep a consistent moisture level. And then, of course, I learned about that. I had much better success having a, a moist medium the whole time. Introduced blue mats, auto watering system. So really dial in that moisture level in the medium. And it's just been a game changer for me. I love blue mats. Um, I've used them for years. Um, they're probably my favorite way to just keep soil wet. Um, blue mats are great. But yeah, and, and like you had mentioned, and I think it's important to note, is that when you're growing in living soil and you let things dry out, you start seeing symptoms, um, plant symptoms that mimic deficiencies. When your soil actually has the nutrients in it that the plant needs, but you let it dry out too much, um, and you know the, the plant was not able to cycle nutrients effectively, and then it started showing these signs of deficiencies. And what people often do is they let their plants dry out too much, they see these deficiencies, and then they have their buddy or themselves or a book help them identify the deficiency and then they start pumping it with that deficiency. I mean, with that nutrient, you know, and, um, and then they create an imbalance in the soil um, that antagonizes another element, you know, creating an improper, you know, for an improper bond, right. An improper chemical reaction. And now you're perpetuating this chain reaction of errors in your soil. And you start seeing all these different burns. You start seeing overdoses of nutrients. You start seeing deficiencies of nutrients and you're chasing your tail around trying to pump your soil with all these different nutrients, spending all this money um, when you just need to keep your soil wet. And that's, that's tough. That's hard for people. And then they want to be like, no, I know that it needs more, more calcium. I know it needs more magnesium. I know it needs more nitrogen. And they just start hitting it and hitting it and hitting it. And then things get out of whack. Things get out of balance. You know, bacteria colonies break down. They don't function properly. It's just keep, keep it wet. Keep it wet, keep it full of biology. That's got to be one of the biggest frustrations for new organic growers is keeping that medium moist. And then, yeah, going through the, the motions that, that you mentioned is like, you know, things dry out and you see deficiencies and you're adding inputs and, and so on and so forth. They can just, sounds like a headache. <laughs> sounds like a big headache there. It is. It's a huge headache. Now, you mentioned you caution people on using small container sizes. What's your recommended minimum container size to use for? organics you can pull off 20 i like to use 45 gallons for for a single plant um if i'm using a container um i grow in beds though i grow in big four by eight you know in like an indoor setting a four by eight bed um you know that's at least 12 inches deep i like to have them 18 inches deep if you don't have enough drainage 18 inches can provide problems so 12 is good for most people well, my bed in my greenhouse is five feet wide and 60 feet long, you know, and 18 inches deep. 
Uh, and that's that's how I prefer to grow is I like to have a solid soil mass because now it turns into like an entire ecosystem um, and roots go really far and mycorrhizal networks go really far and things get transported from really long distances. Nutrients can be transported long distances through mycorrhizal networks. But to answer your question, 20 gallons, I think, is minimum. 45 is what I recommend. Um, but growing in beds is what I think is ideal in living soil cultivation. That makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I've tried growing in, <laughs> you know, organic it puts in one gallon containers, three gallons, five gallons. Uh, I did, had pretty good results with seven gallons. Okay. Uh, then I worked my way up to ten gallons, which I'm actually in right now, and I'm having some pretty good success. But I know that as a track record, the bigger container I go, the easier it's getting. You know, so uh, it's only a matter of time before I'm in a bed. I actually have a two foot by ten foot bed outside for my vegetable garden. And I love it as far as uh, my indoors. It's only a matter of time before I'm in beds as well. So good advice there. Fantastic episode we had today. Great, great talk. I definitely learned quite a bit here. I appreciate you coming on. Can you uh, can you tell the listeners how they can find you and what do you have upcoming in the future? Yeah, for sure. So um, I host podcasts on the Future Cannabis Project every Sunday at 420. Um, I, I rotate co-hosts and we, we go over research papers. It's kind of like high level stuff, really nerdy stuff. Um, each co-host has like a specific uh, specialty that, that we go over. Uh, you can find me on my Instagram. It's at Luna all day. Um, I have a Patreon. Um, if you go to my Instagram, you can look at my bio. There's a link tree to all my different articles and stuff. I write for skunk magazine. Um, I've written for Greenpoint seeds and for SD microbes. So I do a lot of writing. I do consulting. Um, I do podcasts. Um, and my, my Instagram is probably where I'm the most active and I share my different concoctions, my recipes, and my approaches, you know, as well as how I like to shape plants and um, just my overall general approach to living soil cultivation. So it's all mostly on Instagram at Luna All Day. The A in Luna and all is shared. So um, L-U-N-A-L-L-D-A-Y. That's, that's, that's pretty much it. Awesome. I'll definitely have a link to where people can find you down in the YouTube description section below. And then if you're on one of the podcast platforms, just search for her, you'll find her. I have a gut feeling here that there's going to be quite a few people in the comments section asking for a part two. So uh, if we get enough people demanding to, for a part two, would you be willing to come on for a part two where we talk about something else, kind of maybe dive deeper into one of the areas or talk about a different area that you have knowledge on? I'd love to. There's, there's so much to talk about. There's an endless amount of topics to talk about in living soil. So I would be happy to. Thank you. Awesome. Well, if you want to see part two, definitely comment down below and we will get her back on. Luna, thanks so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. This has been, this has been awesome. And uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much. Have a great day.